The Gulag Archipelago, Volume 1, Section 2, Continued. Cassette 2, Side 1. Was it surprising, then, that the son turned out to be a double dealer? As for Podgaisky, he was the son of an official in the law courts, beyond doubt one of the reactionary pogrom organizing black hundreds. Otherwise, how could he have served the Tsar for twenty years? And the son, too, had prepared for a career in the law courts, but then the revolution had come, and he had wormed his way into the Rev Tribunal. Just yesterday all this had been depicted in a very favorable light, but it had suddenly become repulsive. More repulsive than them both was, of course, Gugel. He had been a publisher, and what intellectual food had he been offering the workers and peasants? He was nourishing the broad masses with low-quality literature. Not Marx, but instead books by bourgeois professors with world-famous names. And we shall soon encounter these professors as defendants, too. Krylenko is enraged and marvels at the kind of people who have sneaked into the tribunal. Neither do we understand what kind of people are the workers' and peasants' tribunals composed of. Why had the proletariat entrusted the task of striking down their enemies to people of this particular kind? And as for Green, the lawyer, a man with an in on the investigating commission, who was quite able to get anybody off scot-free... He was a typical representative of that subspecies of the human race which Marx called leeches on the capitalist structure, a category including, in addition, all lawyers, gendarmes, priests, and also notaries. It appears that Krylenko spared no effort in demanding mercilessly severe sentences without reference to the individual shadings of guilt. But some kind of lethargy, some sort of torpor, overcame the eternally vigorous tribunal, and it just barely managed to mumble six months in jail for the interrogators and a fine for the lawyer. And only by availing himself of the authority of the all-Russian Central Executive Committee to punish without limitation did Krylenko, there in the Metropole, continue to hang ten-year sentences on the interrogators and five on the lawyer, plus full confiscation of his property. Krylenko thundered on about vigilance, and he almost managed, but not quite, to get the title of Tribune he so coveted. We recognize that among the revolutionary masses at the time, as among our readers today, this unfortunate trial could not but undermine faith in the sanctity of the tribunal, and we therefore proceed with even greater timidity to the next case, which concerned an even loftier institution. C. The Case of Kozirev, February the 15th, 1919. F. M. Kozirev and his pals Libet, Rottenberg, and Solovyev had first served on the Commission for Supply of the Eastern Front, back before Kolchak, when the enemy forces were the armies of the Constituent Assembly. It was discovered that there they had found ways to siphon into their own pockets from 70,000 to a million rubles at a time. They rode around on fine horses and engaged in orgies with the nurses. Their commission had acquired a house and an automobile, and their majordomo lived it up in the Yar restaurant. We aren't accustomed to picturing 1918 in this light, but all this was in the testimony of the Rev Tribunal. But none of this, to be sure, was the case against them. No charge had been brought against any of them in connection with their activities on the Eastern Front. They had even been forgiven all that. But... Wonder of wonders, hardly had their commission for supply been disbanded than all four of them, with the addition of Nazarenko, a former Siberian tramp and convict pal of Kozirev in criminal hard labor, were invited to constitute the Control and Auditing Collegium of the VCHK, the Cheka. Here's what this collegium was. It had plenipotentiary powers to verify the legality of the actions of all the remaining organs of the Cheka, the right to demand and review any case at any stage of its processing, and to reverse the decisions of all the remaining organs of the VCHK, excepting only the Presidium of the Cheka. This was no small thing. This collegium was second in command in the Cheka after the Presidium itself. It ranked immediately below Jezinski, Uritsky, Peters, Latsis, Menzinski, Yogoda. 
The way of life of this comradely group remained just what it had been before. They didn't get swelled heads. They didn't get carried away. With certain individuals named Maximich, Lenka, Rafaelsky, and Mariupolsky, who had no connection at all with the Communist Party, they set up, in private apartments and in the Hotel Savoy, lavish establishments where card games with table stakes as high as a thousand rubles a throw were the order of the day, along with heavy drinking and women. Kozirev acquired a rich establishment of his own, costing 70,000 rubles, and in fact did not even draw the line at hauling off silver spoons and goblets and even ordinary glassware from the Cheka. And how did all these objects get to the Cheka? And this was where his attention was concentrated rather than in the direction of ideas and ideology, and this was what he took from the revolutionary movement. In the very act of repudiating the bribes he had accepted, this leading Czechist, without blinking, volunteered the lie that he possessed 200,000 rubles from an inheritance in a Chicago bank. Evidently, as far as he was concerned, there was no conflict between such a circumstance and world revolution. Now, how did he propose to make proper use of his superhuman right to arrest anyone at all and release anyone at all? Clearly, one had to find a fish with golden row, and in 1918 there were not a few such fish in the nets. After all, the revolution had been carried out too quickly. They hadn't found everything. How many precious stones, necklaces, bracelets, rings and earrings the bourgeois ladies had managed to hide away. Then one had to make contact with the relatives of those who had been arrested through some reliable middleman. Such characters also passed before us at the trial. There was Uspenskaya, a woman of 22. She had graduated from the St. Petersburg Gymnasium but hadn't gone on to the university. The Soviets had come to power. And so, in the spring of 1918... Uspenskaya appeared at the Cheka to offer her services as an informer. She qualified on the basis of her appearance, and they accepted her. Krylenko has this to say about informing, which in those days had a different label. For ourselves, we see nothing shameful in it. We consider this to be our duty. The work itself is not disgraceful. Once a person admits that this work is necessary in the interests of the revolution, then he must do it. But alas, it turned out that Uspenskaya had no political credo. That's what was awful. She declared, I agreed in order to be paid a fixed percentage on the cases which were turned up, and beyond that, to split 50-50 with someone else, whom the court protected and instructed her not to identify. Krylenko put it in his own words, Uspenskaya was not a staff member of the Cheka, but worked at peace rates. And incidentally, the accuser, understanding her in a very human way, explains that she had grown used to having plenty of money and that her insignificant salary of 500 rubles from the Supreme Council of the Economy was nothing at all, considering that one exercise in extortion, for example, helping a merchant get the seal removed from his store, would net her 5,000 rubles. And another, from Meshcheskaya Grevs, wife of a prisoner, would bring in 17,000. For that matter, Uspenskaya served only briefly as a mere stool pigeon. Thanks to the help of certain big Czechists, in a few months she became a member of the Communist Party and an interrogator. However, we don't seem to be getting to the essence of the case. Uspenskaya had arranged a meeting between this Meshcherskaya Grevs and a certain Godelyuk, a bosom pal of Kosirev, in order to reach an agreement on her husband's ransom. They had initially demanded 600,000 rubles. But unfortunately, by some still unexplained means, the arrangements for that secret meeting became known to the same attorney, Yakulov, who had already done in the three bribe-taking interrogators, and who evidently felt a class hatred for the whole proletarian system of judicial and extrajudicial processing. Yakulov denounced them to the Moscow Rev Tribunal, and the presiding judge of the tribunal, recalling perhaps the wrath of the Council of People's Commissars in connection with the three interrogators, also blundered in terms of class premises. In order to temper the reader's indignation against this leech-like snake, Yakulov, we should point out that by the time of Kostyarev's trial, he had already been arrested and was in custody. They had found a case to take care of him. He was brought in to testify, accompanied by convoy, 
and we are certainly entitled to hope that he was shot soon afterwards. Today we are surprised. How did things reach such a pitch of illegality? Why did no one mount an offensive against it? Instead of simply warning Comrade Zhezhinsky and working it all out in the family, he hid a stenographer behind the curtain, and the stenographer took down all Godelyuk's references to Kosirev and to Solovyev and to other commissars and all his stories about who in the Cheka takes how many thousands. Then, as per the stenographic record, Godelyuk received an advance payment of 12,000 rubles, and Meshcheskaya Greves was given a pass to enter the Cheka that had already been filled out by the Control and Auditing Collegium by Libet and Rottenberg. The bargaining was to continue there, inside the Cheka. Then and there, Godelyuk was caught. In his confusion, he gave testimony against them. And Meshcheskaya Greves had already gotten to the Control and Auditing Collegium, and they had already ordered her husband's case transferred there for verification. But just a moment. After all, an expose like this sullies the heavenly blue uniforms of the Cheka. Was the presiding judge of the Moscow Rev Tribunal in his right mind? Was he really tending to his own business? But it turns out that that was the nature of the moment, a moment totally hidden from us in the folds of our majestic history. It seems that the Cheka's first year of work had produced a somewhat repellent impression even on the party of the proletariat, which still hadn't gotten used to it. Only its first year had passed. The Cheka had taken only the first step on its glorious path. And already, as Krylenko writes, although not very clearly a dispute had arisen, between the court and its functions and the extrajudicial functions of the Cheka, a dispute which at the time split the party and the workers' district into two camps. And that is how the Kosirev case could come up, whereas everything had gone smoothly before and reach all the way up to the topmost level of the whole state apparatus. The Cheka had to be saved. Help! Save the Cheka! Solovyev asked the tribunal to allow him inside the Taganka prison to visit Godelyuk, who, alas, was not in the Lubyanka, so as to chat with him. The tribunal declined the request, then Solovyev managed to penetrate into Godelyuk's cell without the help of any tribunal, and, what a coincidence, at that very point, Godelyuk became seriously ill. One can hardly speak of evil intentions on Solovyev's part, Krylenko bows and scrapes. Feeling the approach of death, Godelyuk shakily repented having slandered the checker and asked for a sheet of paper on which to write his recantation. It was all untrue. He had slandered Kosirev and the other commissars of the checker, and everything the stenographer had taken down behind the curtain was also untrue. Oh, how many themes we have here. Oh, where is Shakespeare? Solovyev passes through the walls, flickering shadows in the cell. Godelyuk recants with failing hand. And all we hear about the years of the revolution in our plays and our films is the street singing of hostile whirlwinds. And who filled out the passes for Meshcheskaya Greves? Krylenko insisted. They hadn't materialized out of thin air, certainly. No, the chief accuser does not wish to say that Solovyev was an accessory in this case because, because there is insufficient evidence. But he advances the hypothesis that citizens still at liberty who were in danger of being caught with their hands in the till might have sent Solovyev to the Taganka jail. This was the perfect time to question Libert and Rottenberg, and they were subpoenaed, but they didn't appear, just like that. They didn't show up. They declined to. All right, in that case, question Meshcheskaya Greves. And, can you imagine it? This broken-down aristocrat, too, was so brazen as not to appear before the Rev Tribunal. And there was no way to force her to. Gordeliuk had recanted and was dying. Kosirev refused to admit anything. Solovyev was not guilty of anything. So there was no one to question. What witnesses, on the other hand, did indeed appear before the tribunal, and of their own free will? The deputy chief of the Cheka, Comrade Peters, and even Felix Edmundovich Dzerzhinsky himself. He arrived in a state of alarm. His long, burning, zealot's face confronted the tribunal, whose members sat with sinking hearts, and he testified passionately in defense of the totally innocent Kosirev and his high moral, revolutionary, and professional qualities. 
This testimony, alas, has not been preserved for us, but Krylenko refers to it this way. Solovyev and Zhezhinsky portrayed Kosirev's wonderful qualities. Alas, you careless shaved tail, you, in twenty years' time in the Lubyanka, they are going to remind you of that trial. It is easy to guess what Zhezhinsky could have said, that Kosirev was an iron Czechist, merciless to their enemies, that he was a good comrade, a hot heart, a cool head, clean hands. And from a garbage heap of slander, the bronze knight Kosirev rises before our eyes. Furthermore, his whole biography testifies to his remarkable will. Before the revolution, he was convicted several times, most often for murder. In the city of Kostroma, he was convicted of worming his way by deception into the house of an old woman named Smirnova and strangling her with his own hand. Then of an attempt to kill his own father. And then of killing a comrade in order to use his passport. The rest of Kosirev's convictions were for swindling, and in all he spent many years at hard labor. One could understand his desire for a luxurious life. And he had only been freed by the Tsarist amnesties. At that point, the stern and righteous voices of the major Czechists interrupted the chief accuser. They pointed out to him that those courts which had convicted Kosirev were courts of the bourgeoisie and landowners and did not merit being noticed in our new society. But what happened? The shave tail, going overboard, poured forth from the chief accuser's rostrum a tirade so ideologically faulty that in our exposition of this harmonious series of cases tried by the tribunals, citing it is to strike a discordant note. If there was anything good in the old Tsarist court system, it was only trial by jury. One could always have confidence in the juror's decisions, and a minimum of judicial error was to be found in them. It was all the more vexing to hear this sort of thing from Comrade Krylenko, because just three months before, at the trial of the provocateur R. Malinovsky, a former favorite of the Communist Party leadership, who, notwithstanding his four criminal convictions in the past, had been co-opted into the Central Committee by the leadership and appointed to the Duma, the accusing power had taken an impeccable class stand. Every crime is the result of a given social system, and in these terms criminal convictions under the laws of a capitalist society and in Tsarist times do not, in our eyes, constitute a fact branding a person with an indelible mark once and for all. We know of many examples of persons in our ranks branded by such facts in the past, but we have never drawn the conclusion that it was necessary to remove such a person from our milieu. A person who knows our principles cannot fear that the existence of previous criminal convictions in his record will jeopardize his being included in the ranks of the revolutionaries. That is how Comrade Krylenko could speak when in a party vein. But in this other case, as a result of his mistaken judgment, the image of the knight in shining armor, Kosirev, was being bespattered. And it created a situation in the tribunal wherein Comrade Zhezhinsky was forced to say, For just one second, just one second, the thought crossed my mind that citizen Kosirev might be falling victim to the political passions which in recent times have blazed up around the extraordinary commission and Krylenko suddenly took thought. I do not wish, and I never have wished, that the present trial should turn into a trial of the Cheka rather than a trial of Kosirev and Ospenskaya. Not only am I unable to desire such an outcome, I am obliged to fight against it with all available means. And he went on. The most responsible, honest, and self-controlled comrades were put at the head of the extraordinary commission, and they took on themselves the difficult task of striking down the enemy even though this involved the risk of error. For this the revolution is obliged to say thank you. I underline this aspect so that no one can ever say to me later, he turned out to be an instrument of political treason. But that's what they will say. What a razor edge the supreme accuser was walking. But he evidently had certain contacts going back to his days in the underground through which he learned how things were going to move on the morrow. This is conspicuous in several trials, and came out here too. At the beginning of 1919, there were certain trends towards saying, It is enough. It is time to bridle the checker. And this moment was 
beautifully caught in Bukharin's essay in which he said that revolutionary legality must give way to legalize revolutionality. Wherever you look, you see dialectics. And Krylenko burst out, the Reb Tribunal is being called on to replace the Extraordinary Commission. To replace? Meanwhile, it must be no less fierce in implementing the system of terror, intimidation and threat than was the Extraordinary Commission, the Cheka. Than it was? The past tense. Has he already buried it? Come now, you are going to replace it, and where are the Czechists supposed to go? Ominous days. That was reason enough to hurry to the tribunal in a greatcoat down to one's heels to testify as a witness. But perhaps your sources of information, Comrade Krylanko, are false. Yes, the heavens darkened over the Lubyanka in those days, and this whole book might have been very different. But I suppose that what happened was that Iron Felix Zerzhinsky went to see Vladimir Ilyich Lenin and talked it over and explained, and the skies cleared. And although two days later, on February the 17th, 1919, the Cheka was deprived of its judicial rights by special decree of the All-Russian Central Executive Committee, it was not for long. Our day in court was further complicated by the fact that the objectionable Uspenskaya behaved abominably. From the defendant's bench, she threw mud at leading Czechists who had not previously been touched by the trial, including Comrade Peters. She turned out to have used his pure name in her blackmailing operations. She used to sit right in his office without any ceremony during his conversations with other intelligence agents. Now, she hinted, at some dark pre-revolutionary past of his in Riga. That's the kind of snake she had turned into in eight months, despite the fact that she had been with Czechists during those eight months. What was to be done with such a woman? Here, Krylenko's position jived completely with that of the Czechists. Until a firm regime has been established, and we are a long way from that being the case, are we really? In the interests of the defense of the revolution, there is not and cannot be any sentence for citizeness Uspenskaya other than her annihilation. He did not say to be shot. What he said was annihilation. But after all, citizen Krylenko, she's just a young girl. Come on now, give her a tenner, or maybe a twenty-five, and maybe the system will be firmly established by then. How about it? But alas, in the interests of society and of the revolution, there is no other answer, nor can there be one, and the question cannot be put any other way. In the given case, detention isn't going to bear any fruit. She had sure rubbed the salt in. She knew too much. And Kosirev had to be sacrificed too. They shot him. It was for the health of the others. Can it really be that some day we will read the old Lubyanka archives? No, they will burn them. They already have. As the reader can see for himself, this was a very unimportant case. We didn't have to dwell on it. But here is a different one. D. The case of the Churchmen, January the 11th to 16th, 1920. This case, in Krylenko's opinion, is going to have a suitable place in the annals of the Russian Revolution. Right there in the annals, indeed. It took one day to wring Kosirev's neck, but in this case they dragged things out for five whole days. The principal defendants were A.D. Samarin, a famous man in Russia, the former chief procurator of the Synod, a man who had tried to liberate the church from the Tsar's yoke, an enemy of Rasputin, whom Rasputin had forced out of office. But accuser Krylenko saw no difference whatever between Samarin and Rasputin. Kuznetsov, professor of church law at Moscow University, the Moscow archpriests Uspensky and Tsvetkov. The accuser himself had this to say about Tsvetkov. An important public figure, perhaps the best that the clergy could produce, a philanthropist. Their guilt lay in creating the Moscow Council of United Parishes, which had in turn recruited, from among believers forty to eighty years old, a voluntary guard for the Patriarch, unarmed, of course, which had set up permanent day and night watches in his residence, who were charged with the responsibility, in the event of danger from the authorities to the Patriarch, of assembling the people by ringing the church alarm bells and by telephone, so that a whole crowd might follow wherever the Patriarch might be taken and beg 
and there's your counter-revolution for you, the Council of People's Commissars to release him. What an ancient Russian, holy Russian scheme to assemble the people by ringing the alarm bells and proceed in a crowd with a petition. And the accuser was astonished. What danger threatened the patriarch? Why had plans been made to defend him? Well, of course, it was really no more than the fact that the Cheka had for two years been conducting extrajudicial reprisals against undesirables, the fact that only a short while before four Red Army men in Kiev had killed the Metropolitan, the fact that the Patriarch's case had already been worked up and completed, and all that remained was to bring it before the Rev Tribunal, and it was only out of concern for the broad masses of workers and peasants still under the influence of clerical propaganda that we have left these, our class enemies, alone for the time being. How could orthodox believers possibly be alarmed on the Patriarch's account? During those two years, Patriarch Tikhon had refused to keep silent. He had sent messages to the people's commissars, to the clergy, and to his flock. His messages were not accepted by the printers, but were copied on typewriters. The first sum is that. They exposed the annihilation of the innocents, the ruin of the country. How, therefore, could anyone really be concerned for the patriarch's life? A second charge was brought against the defendants. Throughout the country, a census and requisition of church property was taking place. This was in addition to the closing of monasteries and the expropriation of church lands and properties. In question here were liturgical vessels, cups and candelabra and the council of parishes had disseminated an appeal to believers to resist the requisition, sounding the alarm on the church bells. And that was natural, after all. That, after all, was how they had defended the churches against the Tatars, too. And the third charge against them was their incessant, impudent dispatching of petitions to the council of people's commissars for relief from the desecration of the churches by local authorities, from crude blasphemy and violations of the law which guaranteed freedom of conscience. Even though no action was taken on these petitions, according to the testimony of Bonch Bruyevich, administrative officer of the Council of People's Commissars, they had discredited the local authorities. Taking into consideration all the violations committed by these defendants, what punishment could the accuser possibly demand for these awful crimes? Will not the reader's revolutionary conscience prompt the answer? To be shot, of course. And that is just what Krylenko did demand for Samarin and Kuznetsov. But while they were fussing around with these damned legal formalities and listening to too many long speeches from too many bourgeois lawyers, speeches which, for technical reasons, we will not cite here, it turned out that capital punishment had been abolished. What a fix. It just couldn't be. What had happened? It developed that Zhezhinsky had issued this order to the Cheka, the Cheka without capital punishment. But had it been extended to the tribunals by the Council of People's Commissars? Not yet. Krylenko cheered up. And he continued to demand execution by shooting on the following grounds. Even if we suppose that the consolidation of the Republic has removed the immediacy of threat from such persons, it seems nonetheless indubitable that in this period of creative effort, a purge of the old turncoat leaders is required by revolutionary necessity. And further, Soviet power is proud of the decree of the Cheka abolishing the death penalty. But this still does not force us to conclude that the question of the abolition of capital punishment has been decided once and for all for the entire period of Soviet rule. That was quite prophetic. Capital punishment would return, and very soon, too. After all, what a long line still remained to be rubbed out. Yes, including Krylenko, too, and many of his class brothers as well. And indeed, the tribunal was submissive and sentenced Samarin and Kuznetsov to be shot, but they did manage to tack on a recommendation for clemency to be imprisoned in a concentration camp until the final victory over world imperialism. They would still be sitting there today. And as for the best that the clergy could produce, his sentence was 15 years, 
commuted to five. Other defendants as well were dragged into this trial in order to add at least a little substance to the charges. Among them were some monks and teachers of Zvenigorod, involved in the Zvenigorod affair in the summer of 1918, but for some reason not brought to trial for a year and a half, or they might have been, but were now being tried again since it was expedient. That summer, some Soviet officials had called on Father Superior Eon at the Svenigorod Monastery and ordered him, step lively there, to turn over to them the holy relics of St. Sava. Thirkov, a former guards officer of the Tsar's household cavalry, who had suddenly undergone a spiritual conversion, given all his goods to the poor and entered the monastery, but I do not in fact know whether he actually did distribute his goods to the poor. Yes, and if one admits the possibility of spiritual conversion, what then remains of class theory? The officials not only smoked inside the church and evidently behind the altar screen as well, and of course refused to take off their caps, but one of them took Sava's skull in his hands and began to spit into it to demonstrate that its sanctity was an illusion, and there were further acts of desecration. This led to the alarm bell being sounded, a popular uprising, and the killing of one or two of the officials. The others denied having committed any acts of desecration, including the spitting incident, and Krylenko accepted their denials. But which of us doesn't remember similar scenes? My first memory is of an event that took place when I was probably three or four. The peaked heads, as they called the Czechists in their high-peaked Budeni caps, invaded a Kislovodsk church sliced through the dumbstruck crowd of worshippers, and in their pointed caps went straight through the altar screen to the altar and stopped the service. Were these officials the ones on trial now? No, the monks. We beg the reader, throughout, to keep in mind. From 1918 on, our judicial custom determined that every Moscow trial, except, of course, the unjust trial of the Czechists, was by no means an isolated trial of an accidental concatenation of circumstances which had converged by accident. It was a landmark of judicial policy. It was a display window model whose specifications determined what product was good for the provinces too. It was a standard. It was like that one and only model solution up front in the arithmetic book for the school children to follow for themselves. Thus, when we say the trial of the churchmen, this must be understood in the multiple plural, many trials. And, in fact, the supreme accuser himself willingly explains, such trials have rolled along through almost all the tribunals of the Republic. What language? They had taken place not long before in the tribunals in North Dvina, Tver, and Ryazan, in Saratov, Kazan, Ufa, Solvizhegodsk, and Sarevokokshaisk, trials were held of the clergy, the choirs, and the active members of the congregation, representatives of the ungrateful Orthodox Church liberated by the October Revolution. The reader will be aware of a conflict here. Why did many of these trials occur earlier than the Moscow model? This is simply a shortcoming of our exposition. The judicial and the extrajudicial persecution of the liberated church had begun well back in 1918, and judging by the Zvenigorod affair, it had already reached a peak of intensity by that summer. In October 1918, Patriarch Tikhon had protested in a message to the Council of People's Commissars that there was no freedom to preach in the churches and that many courageous priests have already paid for their preaching with the blood of martyrdom. You have laid your hands on church property collected by generations of believers, and you have not hesitated to violate their posthumous intent. The People's Commissars did not, of course, read the message, but the members of their administrative staff must have had a good laugh. Now they've really got something to reproach us with. Posthumous intent? We shit on your ancestors. We are only interested in descendants. They are executing bishops, priests, monks, and nuns who are guilty of nothing on the basis of indiscriminate charges of indefinite and vaguely counter-revolutionary offenses. True, with the approach of Denikin and Kolchak, this was stopped so as to make it easier for orthodox believers to defend the revolution. 
But hardly had the civil war begun to die down than they took up their cudgels against the church again, and the cases started rolling through the tribunals once more. In 1920, they struck at the Trinity St. Sergius Monastery and went straight to the holy relics of that chauvinist Sergius of Radonej and hauled them off to a Moscow museum. The patriarch cited Klyuchevsky. The gates of the monastery of the saint will shut and the icon lamps will be extinguished over his sepulchre only when we shall have lost every vestige of that spiritual and moral strength willed to us by such great builders of the Russian land as St. Sergius. Klyuchevsky did not imagine that the loss would occur almost in his own lifetime. The patriarch asked for an appointment with the chairman of the Council of People's Commissars in the hope of persuading him not to touch the holy monastery and the relics, for after all the church was separate from the state. The answer came back that the chairman was occupied in discussing important business and that the appointment could not be arranged for the near future, nor for the distant future either. The People's Commissariat of Justice issued a directive dated August the 25th, 1920, for the liquidation of relics of all kinds, since they were a significant obstacle to the resplendent movement toward a new, just society. Pursuing further Krylenko's own selection of cases, let us also examine the case tried in the Verktrib, in other words, the Supreme Tribunal. How affectionately they abbreviated words within their intimate circle but how they roared out for us little insects. Rise! The court is in session. E. The case of the Tactical Center, August the 16th to 20th, 1920. In this case, there were 28 defendants present, plus additional defendants who were being tried in absentia because they weren't around. At the very beginning of his impassioned speech, in a voice not yet grown hoarse, and in phrases illumined by class analysis, the supreme accuser informs us that in addition to the landowners and the capitalists, there existed and there continues to exist one additional social stratum, the social characteristics of which have long since been under consideration by the representatives of revolutionary socialism. In other words, to be or not to be. This stratum is the so-called intelligentsia, in this trial, we shall be concerned with the judgment of history on the activity of the Russian intelligentsia and with the verdict of the revolution on it. The narrow limits of our investigation prevent our comprehending exactly the particular manner in which the representatives of revolutionary socialism were taking under consideration the fate of the so-called intelligentsia and what specifically they were planning for it. However, we take comfort in the fact that these materials have been published that they are accessible to everyone, and that they can be assembled in any required detail. Therefore, solely to understand the overall atmosphere of the Republic, we shall recall the opinion of the Chairman of the Council of People's Commissars in the years when all these tribunal sessions were going on. In a letter to Gorky on September the 15th, 1919, which we have already cited, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, replied to Gorky's attempts to intercede in the arrests of members of the intelligentsia, among them, evidently, some of the defendants in this trial, and commenting on the bulk of the Russian intelligentsia of those years, the close to the cadets intelligentsia, he wrote, In actual fact, they are not the nation's brains, but shit. Lenin, 5th edition, volume 51, page 48. On another occasion, he said to Gorky, if we break too many pots, it will be its, the intelligentsia's, fault. If the intelligentsia wants justice, why doesn't it come over to us? I've gotten one bullet from the intelligentsia myself. In other words, from Kaplan. On the basis of these feelings, he expressed his mistrust and hostility toward the intelligentsia. Rotten liberal, pious the slovenliness so customary among educated people. He believed the intelligentsia was always short-sighted, that it had betrayed the cause of the workers. But when had the intelligentsia ever sworn loyalty to the cause of the workers, the dictatorship of the workers? This mockery of the intelligentsia, this contempt for the intelligentsia, was subsequently adopted with enthusiasm by the publicists and the newspapers of the 20s and was absorbed into the current of day-to-day -day life. 
and in the end the members of the intelligentsia accepted it too, cursing their eternal thoughtlessness, their eternal duality, their eternal spinelessness, and their hopeless lagging behind the times. And this was just. The voice of the accusing power echoed and re-echoed beneath the vaults of the Vertrib, returning us to the defendant's bench. This social stratum has, during recent years, undergone the trial of universal re-evaluation. Yes, yes, re-evaluation, as was so often said at the time. And how did that re-evaluation occur? Here's how. The Russian intelligentsia, which entered the crucible of the revolution with slogans of power for the people, so it had something to it, after all, emerged from it an ally of the black, not even white, generals, and a hired and obedient agent of European imperialism. The intelligentsia trampled on its own banners, as in the army, yes, and covered them with mud. How indeed can we not cry out our hearts in repentance? How can we not lacerate our chests with our fingernails? And the only reason why there is no need to deal out the death blow to its individual representatives is that this social group has outlived its time. Here, at the start of the 20th century, what power of foresight? Oh, scientific revolutionaries. However, the intelligentsia had to be finished off anyway. Throughout the 20s, they kept finishing them off and finishing them off. We examine with hostility the 28 individual allies of the black generals, the hirelings of European imperialism, and we are especially aroused by the stench of the word center. Now we see a tactical center, now a national center, and now a right center. And in our recollection of the trials of two decades, centers keep creeping in all the time. Centers and centers, engineers' centers, Menshevik centers, Trotskyite, Zinovievite centers, rightist Bukharanianite centers. But all of them are crushed, all crushed, and that is the only reason you and I are still alive. Wherever there is a center, of course, the hand of imperialism can be found. True, we feel a measure of relief when we learn that the tactical center on this occasion was not an organization, that it did not have one, statutes, two, a program, three, membership dues. So what did it have? Here's what. They used to meet. Goose pimples up and down the back. And when they met, they undertook to familiarize themselves with one another's point of view. I see chills. The charges were extremely serious and were supported by the evidence. There were two pieces of evidence to corroborate the charges against 28 accused individuals. There were two letters from people who were not present in court because they were abroad, Mayakotin and Fyodorov. They were absent, but until the October Revolution they had been members of the same committees as those who were present, a circumstance that gave us the right to equate those who were absent with those who were present and their letters dealt with their disagreements with Denikin on certain trivial questions. The peasant question, we are not told what these differences were, but they were evidently advising Denikin to give the land to the peasants. The Jewish question, they were evidently advising him not to return to the previous restrictions. The federated nationalities question, enough said, clear. The question of the structure of the government, democracy rather than dictatorship, and similar matters. And what conclusion did this evidence suggest? Very simple. It proved the fact of correspondence, and it also proved the agreement, the unanimity of those present with Denikin. <laughs> but there were also direct accusations against those present, that they had exchanged information with acquaintances who lived in outlying areas, Kiev, for example, which were not under the control of the central Soviet authorities. In other words, this used to be Russia, let's say, but then in the interests of world revolution, we ceded this one piece to Germany. This book is continued at this point, on the other side of this cassette.